Okay, so I managed. So I, I just need to warn you first that I only arrived yesterday. I had one hour of sleep, so if I fall asleep here, just throw something heavy my direction, and I wake up immediately. Okay, guys, so um, we're going to talk about this uh, distributed processing of large genomic data sets. But the first question that we're probably supposed to ask ourselves, why do we need those data sets in the first place? What is so interesting about it? And various people have various ideas about it, but my favorite thing is something which is called personalized, personalized medicine. And what it really means is that if you sequence enough people, and you so detect enough types so you can associate outcomes of therapy with different, different types and different people. So that means that in the long run you'll be able to be given a medicine which is designed just for you, tailor-made. You'll be able to find things like subtypes, different types of cancer, make cancer therapy much more efficient. So this is <clears throat> one of those reasons that people sequencing those data sets like crazy. Okay? And the, the question is, are we there yet? And uh, the answer to is not at all, no. But we're making the first step into the right direction by sequencing a lot of stuff. And the, the reason why we can do it is this, and that's what we saw on, on the other, in the previous presentations as well. Somewhere around that, that point, the sequence, cost of sequencing started dropping very sharply, which everybody said, well, this is great news. Now we can all start sequencing stuff, right? But this is actually a very bad news for people who work on this curve here, okay? So what they found very quickly is that the findings are flooded and swamped with data, okay? And the, the current way they were storing the data were no longer working. So what I heard on the last week that this particular short read archive having really serious problems with funding, okay? Because there's nobody wants to pour so much money and, and the, current, the current model is not sustainable. Two weeks ago, so in the conference call, these guys were very, very, very worried and they were looking for new storage algorithms because they told them, no, if you, if you keep on storing this much data, we're not going to give you any more money for that because you, we're not going to create new buildings, new space. It just, it, just, it just does not scale. So they're thinking about storing data as deltas and different and diffs between the between the between the various genomes and the and the and the reference genomes. But let's just say for the sake of this discussion that we actually have enough money to do it. Okay? We have enough this, you have enough money, we're not worried about it. We solve this problem. Okay? But this is just actually the easy bit. Because the the, the difficult bit comes here. How do you actually extract information? So let's say I gathered all this information, I have it there. It's raw data sitting all over the place. Now, how do I extract the meaningful information out of it? How do I connect it to the public repositories? How do I make, enable a user to interact with it? Because what is there for the scientists in the lab to interact with the raw data? And what are they going to do with the raw data? They need a bunch of people and a lot of compute and a lot of expertise to process this data in order to get any information out of it. So the question here is like, is it all doom and gloom now? Or is it something that we could, we could do about it? So maybe something what is really needed is a paradigm shift. It's the same if you were organizing this particular workshop 300 years ago and someone told you that you need to bring this guy and this guy from overseas for next week will tell you that's not possible, okay? Because so you need to put them on a ship and they should be traveling several months and we'll get there, but not for next week. But someone, meanwhile, there was a paradigm shift because someone invented air travel. So now you have a different paradigm, okay? And certain things become possible. So this is what we're looking for. Maybe we do not need those archives. We do, maybe we do not need central archives anymore. Maybe the whole problem of finding central archive, pushing the data into one place, then processing the data out and shifting some analysis is really not, not the right approach. So we've been toying with this idea since I started working on, in, the, in this field when the uh, human genome arrived in, in that many, many years ago. And at, at, at that time, parallelization was not such a big deal. We kind of saw this maybe coming at some point, but it was more of, a, more of a sort of geeky thing to do. So we were playing with this, okay? We started developing this, this software system, open source software system that would be able to deal with uh, distributed uh, data federation, distributed source of federating different distributed data sources. And at that point, it was, as I said, it was more of a sort of geeky thing to do and people appreciated this, but nobody really saw that this, this is 
has a particular application. Nowadays, when we're developing new generation software, with which release candidates, we have already a lineup of people who need the software right now because they cannot organize the data. In particular, pharma companies and biotech companies, they just don't have another solution. This is, so, this is the only thing that kind of works. So let's get it off these people and somehow you know, stitch it up and, and try to get it to work because nobody is seriously thinking about Oh, like it was 10 years ago. You know, we build this huge data warehouse. We bring all the data in. Then we mishmash it and create beautiful interfaces and then let people interact. Nobody's even like thinking these in those terms anymore. There is no, pharma company don't have an army of people to do it. They don't have time to do it. They don't have expertise to do it. But they have a lot of data coming on those bloody machines who are just pouring on the doorstep and the guy is briefing down the neck and say, give me the results, you know, or I'll fire you. So they, were, <laughs> so they were desperately you know, trying to do anything to show some results. Like, look, I can hook up all this data, boom, it comes, you know, it's on the screen. Yeah. So, you know, my ass is safe for, for another month, right? Anyway, so we've been playing with this. Um, and what, what, what's the, the idea about this whole thing? So basically the idea is that when people produce the data, they just process and store it locally. They, they never, never shifted or moved anyway. There is a degree of central control, and this is like a registry. But what really, what really happens there is that um, there's a piece of software sitting somewhere in the middle here that presents this whole thing as this was one unified database without actually moving the data anyway. Okay? So well, the idea is that basically each of these centers or data producers that gets the integrated application, which is like this, which basically enables data to be uh, configured, enables uh, these sources to be federated with other sources and then deployed as a, as a single web application. There is some stuff that goes on behind the scenes that makes it a little bit better and this is the uh, certain types of relation optimizations, the uh, something that you call rever reverse star schema which is a little bit like a like a star, classical warehousing star schema. There's a number of things like, uh, for instance, the schema transformation algorithm that takes a 3NF schema and transforms it into this query optimized schema. And it's application that can actually do it um, you know, uh, automatically. So as a deployer, I don't have to worry about all this, get my hands dirty, and just connect to my source schema, makes the whole thing transform the schema and then deploy it automatically, complete with the, with the web server and secure access. And there's obviously because there's distributed sources, so there is a, uh, there's multi-thread and sort of parallel query engine that goes there. You fire a query at the web interface, then you use the query broker, fires the query off, brings the data back, and presents it to the user as this was one sort of singular data set. This is all relational backend, but it uh, sort of runs in those different platforms. So you don't really have to choose a platform. You can deploy it on a, um, a mixture of platforms like people typically do because they have the Oracle instance in-house and then somebody dumps my, my SQL database on them. They're not going to be transferring data because there is no time. They just take my SQL database, put it in, and the software will take care of the federation. And it's finally, there's this sort of what I'd like to think as a user-friendly deployer tool, okay, <laughs> which allows you to connect to, let's say, your relational data source, create a data set, configure this data set, and federate it with other data sources, okay, which are already sitting somewhere on the network and this application is aware of. And finally, you have this uh, deploy button because, as I told you, this is integrated web application. So it pops it on your, on your laptop and now you have deployed your, your federated solutions. Like I said, th this part of the process is, is, is kind of uh, better structured nowadays. Okay, but biologists don't give a monkey about this. They don't care about this geeky stuff. <laughs> what they want to, for them that were important is that if there's a biomass service that is a one place which you can see all the database in one singular place for the same set of interfaces. I don't have to know where they are. I don't have to learn different interfaces. I don't have to figure this all out. Someone connect this all this thing for me and presenting me to me. Similar for the bioinformatician, they have a number of different types of 
programmatic access, or they can use different types of third party tools to hook up to this system. Now, it all kind of looks the same because it, it's the sort of the the process of the uh, of the querying is separated from the metadata completely. So the system actually kind of looks like a, like a really like a relational database in a way that you don't really care what data sits in the relational database as long as you know how to do SQL, right? It can be cars, it can be genes. I don't really care, right? I know SQL. I can do select. I can do where. I can do things like that. I can deal with that. This is a similar idea. So as you can see in various uh, types of APIs, the whole thing looks always the same. So like data sets, so like filters, so like attributes. So like data sets, so like filters, attribute. Similar Sparkle, similar. And biologists and interacting with the GUI, which is the same idea. Data sets, filters, attributes, boom, and green button, go. Now let's see, there's something, some results, but then there's the other buttons, which is very interesting, and you click the button, and now you have the best of both worlds, because now this application produces you just the um, XML, which is ready to be used, uh, so rest in order to query this particular identical, identical query. So the, the system is kind of, uh, it's really a volume of very, very, very simple abstractions. So I, I, just, I just wanted to say that um, I think that the most important thing is that the system is data agnostic and therefore you can um, create a data. As you probably know, the biology is very semantically rich. So it's kind of, if, if software is such as try to understand the semantics of the data, then it's very difficult for someone who is from outside the domain to actually deploy such thing or query, unless you understand what you're trying to query there. But because this querying and, and metadata handling is completely separated, then and a system is very really data agnostic, you can quickly pop in, pop in the software and build sort of um, naive semantics to deal with it without really knowing that much of the system, sorry, of the, of the domain knowledge and just use it as um, expert knowledge. So now I'm gonna show you that um, this is not all vaporware, okay? <laughs> There's some practical applications to it as well. And I'm introduce you to some project, this is a large scale project, collaborative project, and I kind of grouped them into two different groups. One is where they're shared models, okay, and one that use flexible data models, uh, different, but federation does work the same because they don't really care about the models underneath. It just uh, understands how to query them. So the very first one <coughs> is called International Cancer Genome Consortium. It's a very, very ambitious project that it aims to sequence 50,000 human genome projects. So imagine, 10 years ago, that means 50,000. And this is supposed to be split between 50 different countries, and each of the countries will participate by sequencing 1,000 genomes, okay? So the, as you can, the idea is basically that if you sequence so many tumor genomes, you'll be able to gain an insight into cancer. You'll be able to see the patterns and see what's going on, see the subtypes, see you'll be able to link them to the outcomes of therapies and hopefully, hopefully produce better therapeutic strategies. But I can see because the effort's so huge, therefore no single country can actually deal with that. It is split between different countries. You've got 50 different countries. Everybody committed to do 1,000 genomes. And as you can see, this is where the first countries which committed to this, to this effort are. As you can see, the sort of, the landscape which is such that naturally, naturally lends itself to the federated system because the amount of data that is being produced locally in each of these country makes a very, very impractical moving data to any central location. So this is no longer our favorite debate whether we should deal with it centrally or should it federate federated system, it just centrally becomes simply, a, you know, not a practical solution anymore. So you need to basically deal with the re reality as is, okay? So the, the architecture which is behind the scene is basically that <clears throat> each of these countries, each of the centers that produces data, share the data model. So this data model is the same as this data model as this data model. Each of them produces data locally and puts into this into the storage, 
there's a number of databases in the public domain which are federated with this and everything then is exposed to a single user interface okay and the user interface that uh, makes it sort of appear to the user as this was just one database so they don't like to the user it's not really transparent that something goes on behind the scenes and data is fetched from different locations so this is I'm not sure how you're familiar with the cancer resequencing data but um, this is the current content or, or contents of the portal as you can see all cancer resequencing projects are represented here and this is the different data types so you effectively what is created is sort of one-stop shop for all cancer data so just very quickly show you this sort of rather in, inconspicuous looking website and show you in, in practice how this how this appears to the user how they interact with the data so there's a typical search that biologists would do would look up a gene identifier and then predictably would take him to the gene report page and the page looks like any gene report so you would know really what's going on here apart from the fact that what is being created on the fly the data comes from different databases which are stored in different locations although you know to the user appears as a singular page it's actually on the fly produced from different sources as, as the requests as the user send requests and very similar in this very simple user interface combining different query criteria from different databases in one interface there's a query broken that sends queries to various places brings the data back and what is returned to the user something that looks like a uh, basically integrated data set so they they know really aware that by clicking these various things they actually send query to different locations and the, the data is being sort of combined behind the scenes comes back like this and obviously you can then put different types of visualization on top of it it does not have to be necessarily tabular there's something that you're probably aware which which comes with the large genomic data in humans uh, so for for humans this is very important that a certain type of investigations are actually can be tracked to individuals certain types of variations can be tracked to individuals so this data need to be controlled and protected this data cannot enter public domain because in theory someone can just run analysis and find out that you have the problem and you have the problem and I know you have you know I mean so you don't want to you don't want to end up in this situation so this type of the data needs to be protected and you know the system okay so I show you another example this is sort of collaboration between the pharma and the research institute in this case Pfizer uh, on colorectal cancer they, they obviously focus on, on drug targets and stuff like this and kind of the idea is very similar to what I was showing you of the cancer research but this time just very briefly I'll show you the the interesting aspect of this federation is this and this, this is a sample only that you know pharma frequently use this sort of federated system in a slightly different way so they don't really care whether data public data is they, they just they just sort of have this kind of one-way traffic so because system obviously allows you to federate data this way and back so you can expose your data and let other people use it or you can acquire data from from other sources obviously in the, in, in terms of pharma biotech it is it is very one-way traffic so the public data comes in it's proprietary that they're just hooked up from within the system but this never comes out okay so you can you can use it you can use it in in this way as well and now I'll show you two projects which deal with flexible data models which are this is as you can see some heavy biology going on here so <laughs> not sure how many of you uh, a biologist here so let's just say that this is an important research uh, in the model organism which will benefit you know humankind by by looking into into various aspects of, of the disease development but the data landscape is such that there's a number of collaborating labs that have different types of data so this is no longer a shared model I'm not reusing the shared model each of these things have completely different data model there turning behind but the idea is that researcher will only ever benefit from this if you'll be able to see all data in one place if you combine all data together but as I said because of nature of the of the modern research it is very impractical to either move the data or it's it just it's just people tried it many times and never really works so it seems like the, the federative system that each of them will take care of their own 
bunch of the data in their own way, they understand the model, it works, works much better. So this is the uh, interpretive strategy and they basically base everything on the, on the singular system and now they can do various queries which these slides are made here to impress you. Uh, I don't know how, <laughs> how much um, of mouse biology do you know but they can basically connect these resources in this way and present them, present them uh, to the user uh, in a meaningful way. And the very last practical application of this, I'll show you because this is actually quite interesting. This is interesting in a, in a way, this is like I said when we started working with Federation a long, long time ago, this was the very first thing that happened. It was basically that once the sort of software platform was, uh, it's open source was released to, to, to people out there, they started deploying their old data sources. And it was a very, very kind of spontaneous activity such that we, we were not coordinating this and we were not funding this in any way and it was just suddenly grown into the size of the community and the community nowadays looks like this. So I can see this, this whole thing is scattered on four different continents and people deploying this and what it allows it, you know, us to do is that each of these guys can have a, access to all the data, not just their own data but all the data. Each of them deploys on their own data models, there's no shared data models and we're not participating in something. It's, it's kind of like a, in a way, it's like a Wikipedia. And it's, it's just run much less organized, in a way. There's a piece of software that people use to deploy the data sources and suddenly, once they deploy, they kind of become aware of each other, they can talk to each other, so then you can join them and do different things. And over the years, in grow to the size that this is, looks now like a small bioinformatics institute. That, <laughs> going <laughs> just you know, very spontaneous way. Uh, it's a purely community effort. And if you imagine, if you take all this data and house it in one place and hire people to manage this, how much money this would cost to have this? And it's actually free of charge. And it's very environmental friendly also. You know, we don't, don't really. And there is no administrative cost either. It just happens. And this thing. So, it's been sort of growing there quietly and been exposed for a number of years, but we were not really taking advantage of it. People could do like various queries, but it was not very user friendly. It wasn't really exploited in a proper way. Once we realized recently that this is actually a very rich resource and you can do very nice things, we looked at it and started prototyping things and imagined that this, this could be a very nice central resource. This is a lot of different types of data. And this is purely, you know, because technology allows data linking in this way and not, not moving data anyway. So this is some work that we're doing right now to the spec, prototyping and trying to actually leverage a little bit this amount of data that is out there sitting and, and ready for people to use. Um, okay, just to mention before I finish that uh, this re new release candidate is coming very soon and we are, there's a there's an effort, community effort now, to publish some of the papers on these various data sources and have a create a virtual issue in the database journal and just basically document this this whole thing that is happening right now. And I am now happy to take the questions. <laughs>